Now, gentlemen, we usually, uh, when we're studying the Word of God, uh, are accustomed as a female gender to understanding that when the scriptures talk about the sons of God, that it's also talking about us in most uh, contexts. We've gotten used to that idea because there is so much of that gender context in the Word of God, particularly in the older versions. So I'm going to have to ask you to be patient with us today as we camp on in this series a verse that happens to have a she in it. And I want to say straight up, just like we constantly have to do the other and make sure that we see ourselves in that context of Scripture uh, with that gender um, uh, bearing uh, with men, we need you to see it with us as a she on the page. You're also right smack in the middle of it. With that in mind, turn with me to one of the most annoying chapters in all of Holy Writ for women. I wouldn't even have to ask twice what it would be. Proverbs 31. Just turn there and get it over with. I know. I know. Proverbs 31. It really is a piece of work, and I mean that in the best way. Because it is not only written in an acrostic, in other words, every line of it is in order of the Hebrew alphabet, all 22 letters. So, in other words, if it was the English alphabet, the first line of it and the first verse would start with an A, the second with a B, C, D, and all the way through. So, it's a, a beautiful work of art. Not only is it in an acrostic, but it's in a chiastic. Uh, which means the first half of it moves this direction from A to B, and the second half of it moves from B to A. It picks back up on those concepts in opposite order and works back down to it. New American Commentary pointed that out, and I thought it was just amazing. So this, this is something of, of an art. Uh, this is, a, this is a, a piece of beauty. This is like an, an opera in music, this piece of holy literature that God divinely inspired. And so I want to tell you what brought my attention to it. Uh, throughout the time that I had uh, the joy of writing so long in security, it was camped on that 25th verse, uh, Proverbs 31, 25. I'll read it to you. It says, She is clothed with strength and dignity, and she can laugh at the days to come. She is clothed with strength and dignity. So that whole year, I must have said that scripture, and I've said it to him within just the last couple of days. I said that scripture to God a thousand times over and over again. I'm clothed with strength and dignity. I can laugh at the days to come. But then there's just that right, that verse right next to it that I kept seeing. So you can't land on one without seeing the one next to it. That's the thing. It just becomes contagious uh, through the page and through that column. And I looked at the next one and it continued to call out to me. She speaks with wisdom and faithful instruction is on her tongue. I want to say that again. She speaks with wisdom and faithful instruction is on her tongue. Now, I love that. I, I love that version. It speaks to me. It certainly is a sound translation. But I'm going to tell you, it was the King James Version that had me at hello. I want you to hear this. She openeth her mouth with wisdom. And in her tongue is the law of kindness. In her tongue is the law of kindness. What in the world does that mean? You and I are going to camp on in this series, and I'm going to say it over and over again, the new King James rendering of it that says, she opens her mouth with wisdom, and on her tongue is the law of kindness. Well, that was the scripture that was just begging to be looked up. So I went to the dictionaries, and I looked up what the Hebrew rendering would be, and I found that that word for law of kindness, which, which can also be instruction, uh, that word is uh, the word in Hebrew uh, from which they get Torah. It's Torah, the Torah of kindness. Now, in its uh, tightest rendering, uh, the Torah of Israel speaks to the five books of the law. But in the wider sense, it means the entirety of God's instruction. It was both uh, written and oral to them, whatever was the instruction laid out from God. And so they talk about this thing called the law of kindness. And for the next several weeks, you and I are going to talk about that very thing on our Wednesdays. What is it to live by the law of kindness? Because I'm just going to tell you before we even get there that maybe like nobody else I can think of, James and Betty Robinson and everything about the outreaches of life, everything about life today is about the law of kindness. 
They live by this law, and this faithful instruction is on their tongues. And I thought of, of all phrases we could find, man or woman, you would find this uh, underlined and underscored by concept over and over again, that it's just as important for a man to live by the law of kindness as it is for a woman. In fact, the scriptures are telling the son what kind of wife to find. You want a home filled with the law of kindness and with wisdom, with wisdom when we open our mouths. And so that's what I want to camp on with you for a while. What does it mean to live by the Torah of kindness, the law of kindness? I'm going to give you, before we start our points together, I'm just going to give you exhibit A and exhibit B of why we need this lesson. Why would it be so important in the culture in which we live to take some time out to concentrate on a phrase called the law of kindness? And exhibit A is this, because we live in a very mean world. Because we live in a mean world. My brothers and sisters, I want to say something to you. If you and I are not going to get mean with the mean world, it will not be on accident. It will not be on accident. I want to show you a phenomenon. We talked about this some on Wednesdays before, and it just uh, continually strikes me as I watch the news, as I read um, uh, news clips, as I see all the things happening in our culture. I think about this portion of Scripture. I'm going to read a portion to you out of 2 Timothy 3. Jot down that address, 2 Timothy 3, and let me tell you why it's so important. Because it tells us about what the last of days, the end of days, will be like as we get closer and closer to the return of Christ. Christ told us, told us in Matthew chapter 24 all different kinds of environmental disasters uh, that would take place um, in, uh, as far as earthquakes and, and famines, and we know there will be persecution that will be heightened. But 2 Timothy 3 brings something very interesting into the mix. It tells us, it tells us it's in the last days. There will be perilous times, but it doesn't talk about the environment. It doesn't talk about circumstances. All it talks about is what people will be like in the last days. I want you to hear some of these things. It says, they'll be lovers of themselves. Does that sound like any culture you know? Lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited. Listen to this. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Does that sound like any world that sounds familiar at all to us? So I present to you, we're living in this world, and what Scripture tells us is that the further and further you and I get on the kingdom calendar, the meaner people will get. Matthew 24 tells us something interesting. It says that as the days go on toward the return of Christ, people's hearts will grow cold. And we could think about a whole lot of reasons why that would happen, but one would surely have to be that we are exposed to so much that we'll start getting dull to it. We've seen so much violence on TV. We can act it out on uh, all sorts of uh, video games. We have seen so much and are reading so much and have so much overexposure that the, the way our hearts will naturally respond is to get calloused and hard. It will be a self-defense. That it, If we're not going to get mean with the rest of the world, there will be a reason why. We will have determined that we're not going to get cold and mean with everybody else because the world will get meaner and meaner before the return of Christ. That's exhibit A. Exhibit B, I want to base back on the wonderful King James rendering of our verse where it says, she openeth her mouth. Exhibit B of why we want the law of kindness on our tongue is because she openeth her mouth <laughs> and because he openeth his mouth. Because the fact is we're talkers. We're talkers. Some of us may be less talkative than others, but sooner or later, we're all going to open our mouths and whatever is in our heart is going to come out of it. And that's a promise of Scripture. The Gospel of Luke says, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. And it's the strangest principle, and you know it's true, because we'll try to hide how we feel about something and we'll keep it buried in our hearts and think we're, um, we're faking it pretty well, but sooner or later, something pops out of our mouths that we think, why did I say that? Why did I say that? And very often, do you ever go like, where did that come from? Well, your heart. <laughs> Beth, I'll tell you where it came from. It came from your very own heart. Sometimes I won't even realize what's in my heart until something comes out of my mouth and I think, whoa, 
whoa. I mean, even if I think I, I didn't even mean that, well, something got mean somewhere. Because here it comes out of our mouth. Sooner or later, what we bury in our heart, it will get so full, it's going to spill out of our mouths. So the fact is that we are going to open our mouths, and we do get to have a choice what kind of heart we're going to have that's going to express itself on our tongue. And we want to open our mouths with wisdom, and we want the law of kindness to be on our tongues. We are, many of us, natural-born talkers, some maybe more than others. I, I had to look back at that, at the book called The Female Brain, where the author said that the average woman uses about 20,000 words a day. On the average, a man uses 7,000. Now, all sorts of people, I, I looked on the Internet, and it's just like a food fight out there on whether or not that's true. But I can tell you one thing, both genders are opening our mouths. We need to say 7,000 words with the law of kindness or 20,000 words with the law of kindness. Well, one thing for sure, we're opening our mouths. Something occurred to me in preparation for this lesson that not only are many of us talkers, but most of us in this Western culture are published authors. It doesn't have to do with having a book on the shelf at Barnes & Noble. It has to do with every single time we emit a word on a public forum like a blog, like email. You may think that's private. I, I get things forwarded me, to me all the time that at the bottom it says, this is strictly confidential. I'm thinking, okay, how many people have seen this? <laughs> I mean, it's just open game. Every time we get on Twitter and we, and we tweet something, we just published those words. Every time we get on Facebook and, and we make comments there, we are publishing. We are published authors. It doesn't have to do, publishing doesn't have to do with whether or not you get paid for it. It's, does it become a public word? Most of us are publishing authors. We have stuff out there continually that's been made public. We are opening our mouths all right. But the thing that's happened in the culture that we live in is that we are writers, but we do not have editors. And so nobody's editing any of this. It's just like out there, it's out there. My daughters and I all do a blog together. And one reason why I know one of us does it without the other two is because sometimes it takes the other two to go, hmm, I don't think you want to say that. I've got one still in the file in a, a blog that I wrote a couple of years ago that neither girl would let me publish. And so it just sits there. I keep thinking they're going to change their mind someday. They're going to go, Mom, it's not that you, you might not have been on to something. It's that you don't want to say that publicly. Okay, well, fine. So we, we are one another's editors. But really, those of us who have the Holy Spirit living in us do have an editor. We need to listen to it. He says, I know before a word is on your tongue, Psalm 139, before a word is on your tongue, he's going, ah, 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 ah. No, no. And out it comes because we open it, our mouths out of the overflow of the heart the mouth speaks. Now, here's what I want to do with you. I want to talk about five little tastes of the law of kindness on our tongue to see if we'd like it to stick around. Sometimes you have to taste something to know whether you really want to make a meal out of it. And I hope that the Holy Spirit is going to convince us through the things that we're going to gather out of God's Word about the law of kindness that this is the way we want to live. We want to live our lives opening our mouths uh, with wisdom, with the law of kindness on our tongues. Man or woman, this is the way we want to live. And so we're going to get five little tastes of it to see if we like it. And the first one is this. Number one, kindness is not weakness. Kindness is not weakness. Now, I hope you hung around long enough on the other side of that screen to hear this part. I'm so hoping that, that you didn't let your mind wander to something else and think, you know, I really don't want anything to do with kindness because it feels so weak. But I want you to know there is power in kindness. It takes some kind of supernatural power to stay kind in the mean world that we're living in. I want you to hold something here in Proverbs 31, but I want you to go with me to Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6. Jesus says, but love your enemies. Everybody say, love your enemies. I mean, isn't it surprising that it's still there? I mean, we heard it when we were children, perhaps, but there it is, still bugging us to no end. Love your enemies, not just those that are easy to love. Love your enemies. Do good to them and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. 
then your reward will be great and you will be sons of the Most High because he is what? Kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful just as your father is merciful. Now, when he says you'll be sons of the Most High, it doesn't mean that we can earn our way into being a child of God by our good works and by loving those people that would be easier to hate. That's not what it's saying. It's saying we never resemble our Father in heaven more than when we love someone that's hard to love. And then when we're kind to someone who, I mean, who's harder to be kind to? Think of people in your life right now that are just like ungrateful. I mean, I think wicked we all understand. I mean, it's really hard to be, to be nice to somebody that's flat out wicked. But I just want you to think of somebody in your realm of relationship that's just ungrateful. I mean, are, does it get any more annoying than that? You just think, what, I mean, what more could you want? And, and, and they're just, they're, they're just live in that state of, of, of feeling sorry for themselves, constantly throwing themselves a, a pity party that nobody wants to attend, nobody wants to go to it. But somehow we think that, that to be kind to that kind of person is giving them power over us. And we don't realize the power is in the kindness. We are never more like our Father in heaven than when we are kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Now, because some people are just now catching up with us in this series on the law of kindness, what was number one? Kindness is not weakness. Kindness is not weakness. Kindness is a strength. In fact, we're going to see it as a supernatural strength. Number two is this. Kindness gets worn down when we are. Kindness gets worn down when we are. I want you to be thinking, when we're talking about living in a mean world, and we're talking about um, that if we're not going to get a hard heart, it will be because we were purposeful about continuing to uh, let God nurse in us through, through his spirit a, a, a graciousness and, and a, a tenderness to people and a heart that was still warm toward people and trade out that heart of stone. But what we're going to find is we're trying to figure out where did I start getting mean? And I'm not saying this is uh, everybody, but I will tell you this. Y'all, we all have a mean streak in us. All of us do. I mean, something just can come out of nowhere. And, and we can either just like live out there in the meanness or it'll just fly out of us every now and then. But you and I are trying to figure out where does it come from? Like, what, what, why did I say that? I didn't even mean that. Well, where did that action come from? Sometimes it's purely because we are worn down. I want you to write down the address, Daniel 725. Daniel 725. I'm not going to take the time uh, to look it up with um, to, to look it up with you, but I am going to read it to you. Daniel 7:25 talks about uh, the end of days when um, the enemy force, the force of the Antichrist, will speak against the Most High and oppress His saints. Oppress His saints. Uh, that word oppress, and it says it straight out in the um, NAS. It means to wear down the saints. That won't only be true of the way the enemy forces work in the end of days. It's true every single era on the kingdom calendar. Now, one of the things that the enemy tries to do with us is just flat out wear us down. Like now we're tired. We're just like tired. And, and we've been dealing with this mean situation for so long. You may have a, um, someone in your life, maybe it's in your workplace, um, in your uh, extended family, that just is mean-spirited. And, and we come to a place where we think, you know what, I'm going to pay you back meanness for meanness. And I, I want you to know, I come to this uh, out of a personal testimony. The reason why I went to this scripture to study it is because I began to pray it over myself. Because by and large, just kind of across the board, you know, I'm, I, I tend to be a fairly happy person. I tend to be happier than a lot of people may want me to be. You understand what I'm saying? Maybe even annoying. Um, you're going, yes, it's, it is. It is annoying, Beth. I'm glad that you realize that. But, but I, I got in a situation, I, and I don't want you to try to figure out who this is. I live in very close community with about 10 family members. So it could be any one of those. But in kind of that wide range, but in the daily where um, every week you're with them, I just have somebody in my life that tends to be unkind. And I mean, I just like, you just hang in there, 
and you hang in there, and you hang in there. I just need to see somebody's hand if you're just stepping in this one. And I need to see this group over here. Anybody over there? Yeah. Yes. Okay. And you just hang in there with it for as long as you can. And finally, you just go, you know what? You're meaner than a snake, and I'm going to be mean right back. I mean, there's just something about it that you think, I'm going to give them. I want them to know how this feels. And so what happened to me was that I formed a bad habit. I just got to where, well, I mean, and you can imagine it was a free-for-all because that person was mean and I was mean right back. And, and I got into this where I lost the filter on my tongue. And the thing about it, it wasn't with everybody in my life. It was with this person. But this person was important to me, and it's someone I have to do a whole lot of life with, and this is not the way I want to live. It's not godly. I'd find myself every single morning confessing the same thing. And that's when you know, well, you know, maybe the thing needs to change. See, if I'm saying the same thing, forgive me for what I said. Every morning I'm saying, forgive me for what I said yesterday. Or forgive me for what I said day before yesterday. Anybody else? I'd formed a bad habit of unkindness. Now, we can reason all day long that they deserved it. That's not what God's Word says we're supposed to do. We're children of the Most High God, called to be kind to the ungrateful and even the wicked. Uh, we're to love and be merciful like our Father in heaven has loved and been merciful. So it was just flat wrong. There was no excuse for it. But I was in a habit. And I would decide that morning that I wasn't going to do it. And then I'd, I'd get about to like 1 or 2 in the afternoon and boom, there it would come. And then I never could just shut up with that one thing. Because, see, I'd been storing it up. I would find myself thinking I'd daydream of all the things I was going to say. Anybody else? Can tell me, does anybody else have a fight with somebody in, in your imagination? And I mean, it's the per and you say it with perfect timing. And you look a certain way when you say it. I mean, it, and then you just like turn and walk away. And you leave them with it. And it's just like the perfect fight. It's the perfect fight. Only I just kept picturing that and then I just acted on it. Because sooner or later, the overflow of your heart is going to come out through your mouth. And that's exactly what was happening. Well, on my own, I, just, I could not quit doing it. And it had been about three months. Three, I just given way to it, whatever I thought I just said. I could not stand myself. But I didn't know what to do. I kept confessing it to God. I kept asking for him to fill me with his spirit. And you know one of the things he, he directed me to do? I had to go confess it to some people. And here's what I did. I got, had five of my friends I called together and said, I don't know what in the world is wrong with me. But I have lapsed into unkindness. I don't know what has happened to my tongue. And I want God to use my mouth. And yet, here's what I was doing with it. And I said, I need you guys to hold me accountable. And what I had to do, because this person is in and out of my normal um, everyday life and, and every week life. And so what I told them to do, I said, I have to report to you every morning in a group text. I had all five of them on one text. I will report to you every single morning how I did the day before. And anything I say, I have to tell you that I said. They said, okay, we'll do it. And they said, we'll pray you up. Because it's one thing to just confess, but I needed the help of my sisters so that they could see me through. Well, I want to tell you, because I knew I was going to have to report to them. You don't think that habit broke. And what, <laughs> what God wanted me to do was just humble myself and go, I'm really having a problem. And, I mean, they almost got tickled. Because they just, I, it's just really not like me to just go off on a tangent like that. And it, it's just not been, it is, I've had so many strongholds, but unkindness has really not been the big one on the list until just here re recently. And what I think, I, I just got worn down. You just like, just like you get worn out after a while. And, and you no longer have that filter on your tongue. And I'm just telling you, get you some support from some friends that hold you accountable because that ain't no way to live. And you know what? In some respects, the person got nicer, and in some respects, not. But I feel a whole lot better, a whole lot better, because I want to live in the Spirit. I ask you today, are you just worn out? i got to show you all the coolest thing. This is the beauty. I tell you every now and then, why is it we ever even mention Greek or Hebrew words? Right here is the reason. I want to read you a... Um, a wonderful verse that is familiar to many of you out of Matthew chapter 11. I listen to it. It says in 28 through 30, Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Verse 30. For my yoke is, what does it say? Does anybody know it by heart? My yoke is easy, and my burden 
is light. Okay, I've got to tell you something. I don't know why, because you're, you're going to ask me, why did the translators translate it that way? And I'm not sure. I went to my little um, Greek scholar. My, my youngest daughter is, just has really done the academic thing. And I went to her, and I said, I need you to look up this word and tell me why. And she goes, well, now, Mother, I can figure out why they did it, but she said it's still really, by and large, a mystery. That word right there for my yoke is easy, that is our word, the lexical form of that word, krestos, that I told you about earlier, krestos. Uh, if we were going to look for a really tight rendering of that, it would be, my yoke is kind. My yoke is kind. Listen, when we get all yoked up to other people, I'm not talking about marriage here. I'm just talking about yokes. I'm talking about bondage. When we're all yoked up to people, uh, we get in all sorts of unkind situations. But he says to me, let me tell you something. My yoke will always be kind. Always. I'll never be unkind to you. And somebody is tuned in today just to hear that very word. God wants you to hear today, I'll never be unkind to you. He is incapable of being unkind to you. His yoke, even his yoke, is kind. Turn with me to Genesis 37, verse 4. Genesis 37, verse 4. I'm praying God is about to speak a word to somebody and set somebody free. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. They hated him and couldn't speak a kind word to him. For some people that we just find that we cannot be nice to somehow, uh, it, it could be that we're jealous of them, or it could be that we hate them. And I, I want to say something to you today. We don't talk enough about hate because we try to act like that's the thing that we really do not do. I mean, that would be the one thing, like we sin in many ways, as, the, as uh, James says, we stumble in many ways. But, I mean, hate is too far, and how often is it that we'll ever admit to having hated someone, but you know you have, and I know I have. That there are times in our lives when we feel such strong feelings to someone that we literally, whether or not we treat them like a frenemy, whether or not we act, act nice to their face and ugly behind their back, the truth is we resent them, we may be jealous of them, or we just may flat out hate them. And it wears out our kindness. This just helps us to see when it's worn down, where is it going, what has happened to it. And, and it's not that we need our egos built back up, we need our spirits built back up by God and His Word and His people. Get some accountability to get back in the habit of kindness. Unkindness becomes habitual. I mean, it just becomes a way of reacting over and over again until we become someone we don't even like. Listen, you have to live in there with yourself. I, we don't want to be in this trap. I, somebody tell me what number one was so that our audience can catch up with us. Kindness is not weakness. Is not weakness. Uh, number two is what? When we're worn down, kindness gets worn down with us. And number three is this. Kindness is willing to look in the face of the hurting. Kindness is willing to look in the face of the hurting. Okay, somebody say that back to me. Kindness. Kindness is willing to look in the face of the hurting. All right, right down beside it, Job 6.28. Job 6.28. This is when Job says, of course, to the worst friends in all humanity, um, with friends like these, uh, who needs enemies, that's where that saying would have to have come from. Job 6.28, he said, he said to his friends who were telling him all manner of things that they do not know, speaking out of turn, and he says to them, but now be so kind as to look at me. Be so kind as to look at me. I told you in the beginning of this series that this topic reminds me more of James and Betty Robinson uh, th than anything that I think I've ever had the privilege to share on Wednesdays because they live by the law of kindness and they believe in doing the hard thing and as resistant as we are in soul to looking in the face of suffering, it is a must if we are going to res resolve to respond to it. That we've got to be a people that we're blessed of God when we are kind to the needy. They live by this. This is their entire lives. All of us have that tendency to want to turn the channel uh, when it starts into that part, and, and the faces of those who are suffering are shown to us. And on other programs as well that show suffering, our first tendency is to shut it off. But kindness looks right in the face of the homeless, of the hungry, 
of the needy. Y'all, I recently became aware of a condition I had never heard of in my life. Uh, by its um, actual name, it's prosopognosia, prosopognosia, but it means face blindness. Do you know that there are people on this planet, one of them, if you ever want to do any research, is the artist, a very well-known artist, uh, well-known for his, um, the large faces that he paints on canvases. Chuck Close has this very malady. It is a condition where people cannot recognize other people's faces. They have to know someone extremely well, sometimes not even those. For instance, one guy that was being um, interviewed said that he could have lunch with a co-worker and go out of the restaurant and wait for their car to be brought up by the valet, be standing right with him and just say hi there, and I have no idea he had just had lunch with him. Face blindness. It's one reason why the artist Chuck Close, he paints faces is because the flatness of the image somehow helps him to get it in his mind. And he, he says that he paints people that are dear to him for that very purpose. Can you imagine? Yet we are living in a culture of face blindness. We don't want to see it. We don't want it staring in our face. It's so difficult for us and so heartbreaking to us that we just feel like we can't bear it. And we need to be healed of our face blindness. You know, listen, even social networking has figured out that you need a face on there. That hints Facebook, not just book. I mean, like, I, I just, well, I just got on today. I got on book, and I wrote to everybody. No, part of what makes that work for you is because it's got their face with it. Bloggers now have identities with their, with their faces and pictures if they want it. Why? Because that adds the personal aspect to it. It keeps us in this electronic uh, relational life we're living in our culture, it keeps us from face blindness. Somebody's talking to us and they're hurting. Our, our first um, inclination is to look away. No, look them dead in the eye. Lean over the table and go, I hear what you're saying to me. I'm so, so sorry. have got to be cured of our face blindness. I've got to show you something I think you're going to love. Um, turn with me to Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3. You're going into your New Testament. If you're getting ready for work, whatever you may be doing, and, and can't grab a Bible, I'm going to read it to you anyway. But if you're heading toward it, you're going to go about in the middle of your New Testament. Before you ever get to Hebrews, you're going to find Titus. And I want you to hear Titus 3 through 8. We're, we're about to get to discover where James and Betty's hearts come from right here. Titus 3, verse 3. At one time, we too were foolish. Anybody? We were disobedient, deceived, and enslaved. This is all me. By all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness, that's a form of that word we've been talking about in the Greek. Uh, this one is Christostes. Um, when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, He saved us. Not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy, he saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying. It says in verse 4, but when the kindness and love of God, our Savior, appeared... That word appeared is it's, uh, epiphino, epiphino in the Greek. And guess what word comes from it? You've heard it a thousand times, epiphany. When, when the kindness and love of God was made an epiphany before us, in other words, a divine manifestation, that's what an epiphany is, a divine manifestation, it's saying, you want to know when the love and kindness of God appeared as an epiphany? When Jesus Christ walked with his feet on planet Earth and took his walk of passion to the cross of Calvary. That's when. That's when. That word kindness is the word we are um, accustomed to in our, in our current series. But that word love right there is not agape, which is often, or agapao, often found um, in the Greek and translated love in the New Testament. That word right there is uh, philanthropia. Philanthropia, that's our word philanthropy. Philanthropy, I want you to know that, I want to say this nice and loud to somebody, philanthropy is biblical. Uh, the, the, the worldly culture 
is trying to deny God but confess philanthropy. And I want you to understand something. It comes from God. It comes from God. Any desire man has to do that, to do something out of love for humanity, is coming from the image of God, whether or not he is ever acknowledged. And what happens when he is rejected forthrightly in humanitarianism, it's nothing but humanism. He is the philanthropist. He is the lover of mankind. He is the one. He's the one that started it. I want you to see something here. I want you to know when, when we are of kindness to people and we show the kindness of God to them, kindness already has a Savior. It's Jesus Christ. I don't know what God's calling you to do in kindness to somebody else, but it is not to become their Savior. It's not to become their little false Christ. That's not kindness. That will never do anybody any favors. Becoming a Christ to them will never help them. But pointing them continually to the one and only who holds that authority. Kindness already well has a Savior. I want you to see the fourth one. What was that third one? Kindness is willing to look in the face of the hurting. Number four is this. Kindness has good memory. Kindness has good memory. Jot down beside it Psalm 106, verse 7, and I'm going to say it to you. Kindness has good memory. And our scripture is going to be Psalm 106, verse 7, that says, When our fathers were in Egypt, they gave no thought to your miracles. They did not remember your many kindnesses, and they rebelled by the sea, the Red Sea. Most rebellion is caught up in forgetfulness. When we go off in a rebellious tangent, we have forgotten that God has been kind to us. God has been very, I mean, to say, don't say he hadn't if he hadn't. But I'm telling you, your God's been kind to you. And my God has been kind to me even when we were ungrateful, even when we were rebellious, even when we were wigged out in sin. Our God has been kind to us. And I love how it says it in so many plurals, many kindnesses. He hasn't just been kind. He has shown me many kindnesses. I love Hosea 11.4. Hosea 11.4 that says, I led them with cords of human kindness, with ties of love, and I lifted the yoke from their neck, and I bent down to feed them cords of human kindness. I've got to tell you a story because I think it will bless you. I know that uh, Betty and James love uh, Stephen Curtis Chapman and Mary Beth Chapman, his wife, of many, many years and have had them on the program. And I tell you, they are just um, some of the most powerful people of God you will ever meet. And I, I, perhaps you are familiar uh, with their uh, book, uh, the one that Mary Beth actually wrote, uh, Choose to See, about the story of their loss of Maria, uh, their five-year-old daughter in the accident involving the, their um, son in the car and the terrible tragedy that took place as the enemy tried to take down that entire family but every bit of that is turning back on him. And I've got to tell you something that happened uh, because it just showed to me what I'm about to explain to you is one reason uh, amid a thousand that I love Jesus Christ so much for. I mean, this is the kind of thing that just blows my mind about him. A, a number of uh, months back, uh, I, I had, um, was uh, sleeping regular all night, and I need you to know something. In all of these 53 years of living, I just never have had a meaningful dream. And it's not because, been because I haven't asked for them. If there is a manifestation of God or the Spirit, I've somewhere asked for it. I mean, I'm just going, I, I will, I will. And most of the time he goes, you know what? Some people are safer with the word on the page. And so he just, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what we're going to do with you. We're not going to loose a dream on you. So I go all these years and I'll ask him, oh, Lord, teach me in my dreams over and over. Let me have a dream of you tonight. I wake up the next morning, he goes, in the scriptures. And so that's how we do this. But this particular night, like every other night, it happened just before the morning. A friend of mine was telling me just a little while ago about a dream she had, and she said it also happened just before she awakened, and we think that so we'll remember it. And I had a dream, and I saw Mary Beth Chapman in my dream. And, and it was the oddest thing because I was in an arena, uh, the likes of which I've spoken in many, many times through Living Proof Live. It, it was a, a large arena, and the back of the 
of the uh, stage was like every one I've so often seen. All these heavy cords, all the gaff tape down on it, all the, the sound tables, all the machinery that it takes, all the, the, um, the lighting, the men back behind it. I can see in my dream all of their, you know, their head um, sets on so they can talk to one another. A scene that I have seen more times than I can possibly count. But I was back there with it, and I was sitting on the edge of one of the tables watching everything, and I was feeling my own heart, and it was interesting. I was not nervous. And I, I get very nervous before I speak. I've never somehow um, conquered that. Um, I just, it just is scary. And I tend to think, like, you should be a little scared. Uh, when it's a lot of people, that's like, whoa, whoa, that's, that's, that's a big responsibility. And so I knew in my dream I was not the one speaking because I was not afraid. I didn't have any, I wasn't thinking over notes. And I have recurring dreams of speaking all the time, and I'm all up in it. I can feel all my emotions. I could wake up and my neck could be splotched. So I knew, I thought, I'm not the one speaking. And so I'm thinking this in my dream. I see Mary Beth and Maria walk up in the dream as clear as could be. I can tell you exactly what Maria had on in the dream. It uh, comes up uh, with Mary Beth. Maria is right to her side, right about that five years old, kind of have on, has on a big um, white collar, those chunky bangs are down in her face. And she's just kicking around and laughing. And they come to talk to Mary Beth. And even a guy that I work with all the time was talking to her. And I could tell that she was the one about to speak. And Maria was just like twisting her almost into a pretzel right there. And I was beholding this whole thing and thinking how I could not wait to hear it. And boom, I awakened. And I mean, in that moment, my eyes popped open like this. I'm holding the covers up like this and I thought, whoa, I knew it meant something. I knew that it did. I thought that I even maybe knew what it was. I thought that maybe it was God showing me in a dream that part of the Chapman's healing, and specifically Mary Beth Chapman's healing, would be that she would minister hope through what she had been through, and that people would be able to see how it had turned back on the enemy, and glory had come to God, and good had come to mankind. And I felt like somehow her healing is going to come in part through her pouring it out. Now, you need to know something. Mary Beth was not speaking at this time. This is not her thing. It's not her husband was the one out front. It was not her. So this was very out of the box, but I just was certain of it. And I didn't think that, um, that somehow um, uh, Maria was some kind of ghost next to Mary Beth. I knew that Maria was in heaven. I knew that the, the symbol of her in the dream was that in telling that story and in telling the redemption and healing God brought, that there would be healing to her soul and that their joyous memories about Maria would be restored and they would overtake the ones of such tragedy and such um, just uh, a violent um, kind of injury. And so I was like, whoa, what do I do with this? What am I supposed to do with that? And so I, I, just, I was just like baffled before God. I thought, well, okay, you gave it to me. You're going to have to tell me what to, to do. I don't know what to do with it. Well, a couple of days later, it was Mary Beth Chapman's birthday. And so I thought, I'm going to text her. I was at an event, and I knew she had a big thing that weekend too. Uh, but I, I texted her. I said, happy birthday, my friend. And I said, uh, listen, I was really nervous even when I texted. I said, I had a dream, and I don't have dreams. And I just want to ask you if it has any significance to you. And if it's not a confirmation, because I don't, I don't think God works that way. I don't think he just tells it to somebody else. I think it comes as a confirmation. I said, if it's confirmation, great. If it's not, dump it. Don't trust it. So she writes me back and she said, that is a very interesting. When are you going to call me? I said, well, I'll call you after I get home. Okay, I call her and I'm nervous. I'm nervous. Because when someone has lost a child... Even saying their name, you better have a good reason. Because that's tender. Don't mess with the mother's heart. Don't mess with the father's heart. Some of you know just what I'm talking about. I thought, I'm going to bring this up, and I'm going to knock this scab off this wound. And I just, like, so my heart was just pounding. I said, okay, Mary, let me tell you this. And so I went through the whole dream, every detail of it, and then dead silence. I said, well, now, I, I don't know for sure what it means, but I thought maybe it meant... And I began to say, dead silence. I said, whew, I mean, the perspiration is breaking out on my, on my face. I'm thinking, okie doke, okie doke. Suddenly, 
boom, she begins to sob, sob. And when she starts sobbing, I, I mean, I start crying, and I'm going like, whoa, whoa, what? And she said, and Stephen is sitting right next to her because I talked to him before I talked to her. And she said, Beth, you're not going to believe what I'm about to tell you. She said, a few nights ago, y'all stay with me here, a few nights ago, they were with a pastor friend of theirs. And she said she just was having a bad day. Y'all seeing the chills coming up on my arms? And she said she had talked to Stephen Curtis, and she told her husband, I just want to dream about her. I just want to see her in a dream and feel like I'm with her again. And so Stephen said to their minister friend, it was the three of them together, he said, listen, could you just pray with us about this? Because God can say no. But could we ask God, would you just give Mary Beth a dream of Maria so that she could just see her for a few split seconds? Y'all need to know something. God did not give it to her. He gave it to me for her. Stay with me here. Stay with me here. Because do you know what would happen to a mother that only saw her uh, child that had died in a dream? I don't know about you, but I'd want to go to sleep and I would not want to wake up. It was too early in the process. There might come a time for Mary Beth when it would be the most wonderful thing on earth to have dreams like that. And she'd wake up with joy. Right now, if I were her, I'd want to go to bed and not get up. But you know what he did? Joel, we figured it out. It was the same night. They prayed that night. That morning, just before I woke up, I had the dream. He gave it to somebody that Mary Beth would trust. She trusts me. Whether or not she should, she does. <laughs> she, she knew I wasn't making it up. And she just bawled and bawled. And I, I was so flabbergasted. I said, does it confirm anything? She said, Beth. She said, Stephen Curtis has been telling me. She said, my daughter's been telling me that God is calling me to speak. And she said, I've just not been receiving it. But, and she, she dealt with that part of the information later. But all that meant anything to her right then was she had the dream. God did hear my prayer. He did hear my prayer. He did give the dream. He just gave it to my friend instead of me. I tell you, when we hung up, I drove home. I did not all. I said, oh, God. That you would do that for a mother and you took another mom because it kind of took two women together to do the thing. I don't know who else it would have meant all that much to, but the two of us together that you let two moms have a moment like that. That, girlfriend, is loving kindness. That, guy friend, is some loving kindness. Kindness has a good memory. You can trust your God. We've let the mean world get to us. We've let mean people get to us. There's a kind heart in you because Jesus Christ put it there. Open our mouths and let the law of kindness be upon our tongue.